Hi guys, how are you? Welcome back to Real Macroeconomics and Investing. All right, I'm going to do a different kind of video. I don't think I've ever done one like this before. Maybe I have. Uh, I don't remember. But uh, I think it's time that we do something that where somebody says something positive that I agree with. Um, and, and I want you to, uh, to really listen to what he says, uh, Jim Chanos, uh, what he says and how he says it and what it means because i think a lot of people don't understand it uh first of all if there's anybody that understands bear markets uh, it's going to be jim right he first of all to be a, a short seller you have to be extraordinarily extraordinarily fucking good much better than just a a, a normal trader that's that's number one two uh as i've said many times i you know how many how many bear markets have i ever traded? i have very limited experience when it comes to bear markets uh, and uh, the reality of the situation is uh, most don't have experience uh, trading a, sh a bear market uh, because you haven't really had one since 2000, right? And most, most guys uh, around for 20 years now, they've seen one, and that was the great financial crisis. So, uh, and, I, and I assure you, they were not as uh, sophisticated in, in understanding uh, economics, uh, stocks, and so forth, uh, back then as they are today. So, again, you know, how conscious were you in 2008 in trying to understand what was happening? Uh, so, uh, you get somebody like Jim, who's been around for 35 years and has, you know, really uh, made a go of it, and he's still around to talk about it. That that's huge. All right. Uh, now, obviously, he deals more with individual stocks, with companies, and so forth. But I, again, I think there's a lot of value in this video if you understand what he's saying. So I'm going to try to explain it uh, for you, simplify it, and 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 see if it can make sense for you. All right. So let's get started. Let's let's listen. I'll stop it and and comment and so forth. Where where all these different narratives compete with actual numbers, uh, it can be frustrating. It can be exciting. I, I like to think of it as an, an exciting moment in time where you know making short selling great again is is pretty straightforward. There are a lot of different opportunities, but I want to you know you know fully loaded just kind of you know take your pulse on on the kind of short selling environment we have relative to the ones that you may have seen before. Well. I guess uh, I guess I could uh, uh, segue into that by by mentioning uh, what Carson uh, said somewhat memorably yesterday uh, on your uh, in your interview uh, that he he sort of likes to he he, he basically leans into short selling he, he likes to f around <laughs> and uh, sadly I think for short selling for the last ten years uh, short sellers have mostly been the f e not the f r <laughs> and uh, that. Uh, I think that that's you know a lot of us a lot of us exhaustion is setting in because things have gotten in our corner of the world uh, silly and then sillier. You see what he said? Well, first let's go in the beginning. Um, you know, it, it, who's the fucker? And who's the fucky? Right. So for the past ten years, it's been almost impossible, uh, and it's getting exhausting. Right. The bears. The short sellers, they are exhausted. They have been annihilated, trashed, beaten up. Okay, that to me is one indicator. That's something that you really want to pay attention to, okay? Because uh, that's usually what's going to happen. That it's just going to, people are going to get exhausted and uh, they give up. And that's that's what markets do, right? Um, and what we're seeing now is really the uh, the advent of just all kinds of questionable business models being promoted and going public, and uh, it's not it's not about Apple, um, it's about uh, you know space travel, and I think that that it's a big difference in terms of the speculative environment a few weeks ago um, or a few uh, a few years ago versus today. Um, you've got a, a much much more speculative element. Uh, in the markets, really, since late last year, since I think when you and I sat down the last time, you saw the advent of uh, retail speculation starting in the fourth quarter of 2019, pre-COVID, and it's continued right on through 2020, which is making this year so sort of fantastic um, in terms of the swings in the marketplace and the valuations. 
on really questionable businesses, um, things that, that you and I would have probably laughed about 10 years ago. Um, could you believe people did this in 2099? And they're not only doing it again, but they're doing it at, in magnitudes greater amounts. Yeah, and we'll get into that in particular on, on the SPACs. I mean, that's a... So what he's basically saying here is, I mean, I'm sure you understood, but what he's saying here is, well, you know, back in 2000, 1999, 2000, it used to be because of the internet stocks and so forth, and now we have the the space, right? Oh, we're going to go to space, we're going to have rockets, we're going to have this and that, and the the speculation has really risen dramatically. And and you can see that with Hertz, right? Remember, it went bankrupt, <laughs> and it went up like 200%. Um, uh, you know, th there's so many, look at Tesla, right? It's just going straight up for no no apparent reason uh there's you know nikolai there's all these other he's going to talk about it here but again you know we are in a multiple expansion and that's why when you see the pe right uh rising in the way it is you know and everybody knows it it's not like it's a secret we all know it uh it's problematic you get that multiple expansion you're paying more and more and more and more and more for this for less and less and less earnings that's problematic a, a blazingly obvious one to many of us, uh, but just to take a step back on like market structure and what's been frustrating for a, for a long time uh, for short sellers, slide four guys, is just this shift. You know where we have the indices. To your point, it's you know used to be actually all about Apple and Microsoft and the five stocks driving the index. So you'd have a tough time fighting that market beta. Uh, but then you know post that, you know that 80, 85 percent of daily trading volume was systematic at one point pre uh, the hoodies coming into the game. Now 15 to 20 percent of it, I would just say, isn't that just the point? You know, whether it's 50 or 70 million uh, retail brokerage accounts interacting on the edges of volume every day, that's what's really perpetuated it. I mean, you, you, they chase narratives. I mean, you've seen outright frauds being chased. You've seen bankruptcy stocks being chased. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like this in 20 years. Well, in, in, in more, shall we say, normal markets, uh, pretty strong evidence of wrongdoing at a company will generally put a valuation black cloud over something, and, and the bulls and bears can argue. But in this environment, similar to, again, certain periods we've seen in the past, uh, the advent of a negative story is actually a positive. Um, <laughs> it's a positive factor. And, and, and so a short interest is a positive factor. Um, uh, people pointing out uh, accounting irregularities is a positive factor. And it's only when the companies admit to it themselves, a la Wirecard or Luckin, uh, that you get you get the re-rating and then it happens all at once. But up until then, now companies are getting the benefit of the doubt in any, any questionable story. Right there, right there, exactly, exactly. So if there's a high short interest, well, that's bullish because we can squeeze them. Uh, if, if there's an accounting irregularity, well, it's not selling off, so we buy it. Uh, it you know, COVID cases are rising. Oh, good. You know, we're going to go out and we're going to buy stocks because uh, they're going to stimulate more. Uh, COVID is falling. Oh, okay, great. See, we're going back to normal. Buy stocks. No matter what, what the narrative is, no matter what it is, doesn't matter. Everything is always positive. You see the problem? Hertz goes bankrupt. Oh, let's go buy it in bankruptcy. <laughs> uh, government is lowering interest rates. Uh, government is repoing. Government is QEing. We're spending up a storm. More deficits than ever before. Buy stocks. See, everything is about the positive. There is no negative. So think about these things. Yeah, that, that's unusual. Yeah, and if you guys, you can show that. That's actual data. Jim is obviously always uh, actuarially talking about numbers as opposed to narratives. He'll, he'll mix the narrative in with, with that, with the numbers. But if you show factor exposures, I mean, high short interest as a factor exposure has been just an epic long. I mean, it's up 20, over 23% in the last six months. So it's a big thing for us to fight. But that's, yeah. also, that's also why I say, Jim, like I'm excited about it. Like when I see a stock like Nikola, where it's actually now not even a debate, I mean, you have all you have to deal with now is is you know is the short interest and, and dealing with that day to day. But I mean, it's it it could be a moment in time. I mean, most bubbles, as you know, I mean, they're only obvious when you look backwards. And a bubble is something that stops going down and then makes a lower high and then starts to go down faster. And you see, it makes a lower high and then it goes down faster. 
that's the key that's the m pattern that's what he's talking about okay so again you know these these words they might just kind of you know go in one ear come out the other but listen to what they're saying right that lower high and they go down lower high for no reason and then down they go right but you only see it after the fact and that's actually what the Nasdaq just started to do, or a lot of these kind of story stocks started to do today. And I think it's kind of a very interesting day to be having that discussion as a result. Do you agree or disagree? Do you think it's going to be tough sledding into the end of the year, or, or it's kind of an open hunting season finally? Well, first of all, let me correct you, Keith. Uh, Nicola hasn't revealed any fraud this week, okay? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. I yeah. think it's on firmer <laughs> than you might think. Um, you see, like, yeah, like stocks like Nicola is, think about it. Everybody knows it's bullshit. Everybody, but they're buying it. They're buying it. You see the, the insanity of it all, right? Everything is an insanity. Everything. Yeah, I, I mean, they, look, no one ever knows. I, I, I remember uh, in, in March of 2000, um, the market just started going down, it, 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 and uh, there wasn't a, a catalyst. Uh, the Fed had not raised rates. It was raising rates uh, during that whole period. Um, and there was no corporate announcement, but come around March 10th or 9th, I'm forgetting the exact day, the market just stopped going up and started going down. And it was an intergalactic bull market peak. We just didn't know it. Right. That's exactly what happened recently with COVID. It was going up and up and up and I kept saying euphoria and I was at the point where I'm like, you know what, I'll, I'll never trade again if this thing doesn't go down. I won't do it. I'm done. Because whatever it's doing, I don't understand it. And therefore, I'm just wasting my time and everybody else's time. I'm done. And then one Thursday, it was a Thursday, it went down for no reason. And everybody's like, why did it go down? And then the next day, it went up a little bit. And then a couple of days later, boom, straight down. Nobody understood why. No announcement, no rate hikes, no nothing. So the same thing happened in 2000. Same thing happened in 2020. Okay. So be mindful of these things. These are important. One day we're going to wake up and it's just going to be down. We're not going to know why and then we'll figure it out. But that should be a good signal for us. But again, um, there were no catalysts. There were no, there were no, in hindsight, oh yeah, it was obvious that week that things were going to uh, change and we don't know i mean i, I who knows i mean I, I i tried to tried to avoid you know uh, picking market tops and bottoms because i'm not very good at it but um certainly things are getting sillier and sillier and sillier you, you mentioned the bankruptcy stocks um we've got this this incredible spac mania going on where companies that couldn't dream of going public and couldn't pass an underwriter's test um, now are, are, are able to go public seamlessly through a SPAC. Do you see how comfortable he is with saying, well, I don't know when the top is. I'm not, you know, I'm not good at it. You see, he's an expert. He's one of the top of the top. And he's like, shit, I don't know. That's right. You got to be comfortable with not knowing. That's the point. You can't, you can't sit here and always have to know. You don't have to know that, you, you know, you have to just kind of grind it out. You have to grind it out. And you'll only make money a couple of times a year. I keep saying that. Only a couple of times a year. But when you do, you're going to really hit. Okay? It's going to make up for all the other ones. Uh, it's a lot better than the 701 rule, right? Where you're right seven times and then wrong once and you blow up your account. No. You don't want that. You, you want the opposite. You want, you want to be wrong seven times be right once and, you know, drastically increase your, your account portfolio. And, and, you know, that's, that's a very big deal to be comfortable with not knowing. It really is. Because a lot of people, they go, you know, they open up an account, they put some money in, they have a, a little website, there's a buy and a sell, and it gives them freedom. Freedom to sit here and choose from the options that are given to that person via media or some newsletter or whatever. And here's the options, you know, what, which one do you pick? And then you pick buy or sell or whatever it is. And that freedom um, is what people seek. And then if it goes up, they feel like they're right. And they, they, they long to be right. Right. And then when it goes down, while well, it's bullshit, you know, they'll rationalize it. They'll look for data only to support why that's not the correct thing and so forth. 
but there's a fine line between really understanding how to do it properly if it's correct or not uh, uh, versus feeding your your ego it's not the same thing uh, it's not the same thing to to tell someone well i can give you a 60 40 percentage that you will be right versus a 50 50. well how do you know the difference it's very difficult to convey that information to somebody because it's such a small margin of difference right how, everybody's going to go with the seven to one guy the guy that's going to be right seven times and blow himself once they're not going to go for the seven seven times the guy is wrong one time he's right in your your, your portfolio explodes in in the positive way uh, so again you know you got to have that conversation with yourself and and think about these things what what uh jim is saying here i think we're getting about four or five filings a day now i think we, we, we're up to that um and so the one thing i do know from my 40 years is that given enough time wall street will do a very very good job in creating supply for people that want to pay up for uh, questionable or worthless assets yeah well, wall street creating supply that's a great way to think about it it's also they've also yes yes Wall Street will always give you what you want. We're going to create supply. You want it? I'm going to get, create more stocks, more shares. Here, take them, buy them. Keep paying up for it, right? That's so important what he just said there. It's always going to create enough supply. Look at housing. Remember housing? Everybody wanted a house. Everybody wanted to. So they increased supply until it blew up. China stocks. All you had to do is walk in and say, well, this company is associated with China. They have exposure to China. Everybody ran out and bought it. What happened? They started pumping in all these Chinese stocks that really didn't even have any earnings. They didn't even question it. Forget about it. Just, hey, it's, you know, Kihu or whatever the hell it's called. Or what, you know, any any company. Oh, it's China. China. Everybody would run out and bought. What happened? They all exploded. All right. It's the same thing here. Same thing. Greed is always going to blow shit up. Always. That's just fundamental. They create demand on the narrative side uh, politically. Now, you had some thoughts on this Kudlow uh, reveal. It's not like you, you could see it happening. You just needed somebody to report it so just so you have the names and the numbers and whatever. But that's, that's disgusting. Let's, I, I, I think it's disgusting. Do you agree or not? And, and what part of that? Like we, have, we actually have uh, an administration that's trying to prop the frickin' thing up every day. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the story crystallized. What that story crystallized for me is is just the political um, divergence that we have, and and sort of the feeling out there amongst the general public that the game is rigged. But look, I, you know, David Tepper, who's mentioned in the article and who's a friend, mentioned on CNBC, you know, in, uh, around the Super Bowl that you know he was getting concerned about coronavirus. Uh, so, and and lots of the hedge funds were beginning to talk about it at the very end of January, early February. Ah, you see, uh, I, I, I forgot who I told this to, but I said, you know, if you go back and you, you look at the tapes, end of January, beginning of February, nobody was really talking about coronavirus. Nobody. I was posting it for subscribers. I'm like, look, look at the, look at the death rate in China. Every day it's doubling. You know, by this date, I was making projections. By this date, it should be this much and then that much. And, and, and that was all the way back in January. Um, so no one had a clue what was to come. They didn't even start talking about it until the end of January, beginning of February. Okay. Uh, and, and I hope that you can do some research and if you do, you know, go, go back to those times, find some videos of CNBC or something, you know, link them here, but it's fascinating how obvious it was. And yet no one was talking about it. It was so obvious. You can't have an airborne virus not infect the entire planet. That's just not, not going to happen. Okay. And then if you go look at the CDC website, and they were already saying, you know, it's a global emergency, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. But the problem is, is that I think what crystallized that story, and, and uh, people know my political leanings, um, uh, but it's just the feeling that... Uh, the public was getting one set of briefings uh, from White House spokesmen, not to worry, it's mostly contained or all contained. 
Um, and then uh, and then uh, donors and uh, insiders were getting a different set of, uh, of of more worrisome briefings inside the White House. And it just gets to the whole idea of, of just that's out there, both on the left and the right, that there's two systems here. There's a system for the corporate class, the financial class, and then there's a system for everybody else. Absolutely. Right. That's absolutely right. And that was that was the key for me to to be like, this is going to be a problem. You know, I don't care what they're telling me on television. I was in Asia. I was flying into China. I knew exactly what was going on. I saw the masks among, amongst uh, Asians immediately. They didn't even think twice about it. Everybody was wearing a mask. I, I saw the shutdowns. I saw what was happening. And then, and you know, in the West, nobody had a fucking clue. Now, I, it just so happened I was benef- I benefited from that experience, but still, but still, you know, when when the government is telling you one thing and then they're doing another thing uh, behind the, the scenes and how late they did it in the stock market with hedge fund managers and so forth, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating, really. And I think that that and COVID has just made that worse. Well, it's it certainly made like the feedback I get. I, I interface, as you know, with a lot of money managers across you know, you know different strategies, and there's a class of just kind of like I don't know how else to say it other than like, ha ha, you know, Keith, you're an idiot. You're not plugged into when this is going to happen, and that really pisses me off. Like, <laughs> you know how I am. I mean, I just don't like. So I side with you know the people, and I always have tried to. You know, and 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 I think that that's that's what the country's all about. But I mean. How does that, does it matter? Like, I mean, really, the ha-ha comment is like, yeah, you, you embrace the game, suck it up, and... Yeah, and, and, and it's, it would, obviously, it gets back to the, you know, would you rather, would you rather be right or righteous or, or make money? But, but it also gets back to the tail risk, if you want to be a really, a, a, you know, wise guy about it, and, and that torches and pitchforks are undervalued. Um, and, and that, that uh, continue this, you continue this type of political animus where the the uh, the one percent or the elite are brought in, under the tent and everybody else is left to fend for themselves. History tells us that's uh, that's not a tenable position for a long, long period of time. Yeah, you see, social unrest. I've been saying that three years now. Social unrest is the biggest risk to the global economy. Uh, look, look what's happening, right? I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not, you know, I'm just telling you that that is a very big factor. And and even he's saying it, right? Uh, you go to Ray Dalio, he's saying it. Everybody, you know, that has some kind of a clue as to, you know, financing and economics and so forth, they're all worried about it. And they should be worried about it. Okay. Um Anyway, I'll shut up. No, you don't want to be in the tower when the square is getting fired up at this at this at this pace. Um, okay, let's just hit on a couple topics. I mean, one in particular that you uh, just brought up, specs. Yeah, I mean, the accountability yeah. is, seems to be zero. There are some you know, that we found. Uh, hopefully, our research analysts are right. There are, are not you know frauds. They're actually you know, pretty pretty good stories that have underlying cash flows and assets kinds of things that we would like. Um, but, but there are a, a lengthening list, to your point, just by virtue of the numbers of issues um, you know, out there, where it's just, I, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. CNBC trots these people out, and they, they pump, their, and pump and dump on their book. I don't know about the dump side, but there's certainly the pumping going on. <laughs> well, the, to talk about SPACs, you also have to marry that with the other concept that's driving uh, the narrative side of the stock market, and that's TAM, um, Total Addressable Market. Because a lot of the, the the more egregious SPAC stories are TAM stories, right? That- All right. So for my subscribers, the people that follow me, TAM is basically a cute story. Okay? That's all he's saying. Is, uh, just think of it like that. That there are, there's no profitability, but there is this monster market that if, if their algorithm, their piece of software, whatever it is that's got people excited, um, works that it's just a ridiculous amount of money that they can capture from these giant markets. So think about think about WeWork, which never got public, uh, uh, disrupting uh, the subleasing of office space. Um, think about uh, Lyft and Uber, which had a TAM, a monstrous TAM when they went public 
of disrupting basically all types of transportation. Uh, and now you're getting to kind of the, the absurd stuff. Um, and we always look for companies where the business model itself is inherently and structurally unprofitable, but they try to dress it up as, a, as a, some sort of network effect TAM story. So consider a recent SPAC by a well-known promoter that is now in the house flipping business. <laughs> and, um, and so they've taken a company that will digitally buy your house and, and, uh, and have built a story around this and merged it into their SPAC. Now, we have, we have companies already doing this. Zillow, which is publicly traded, you know, has a house flipping business yep. and it loses money on every house um, and makes it up on volume. And when you have business models that have discrete money losing aspects to that, that have no network effect, mainly you, you lose money on every widget, but make it up on volume, you have a bad business. And if you flip houses for losses, or you sell used cars at a loss, or you make bad loans to bad credits, your TAM is almost infinite. People will flock to do business with you. 100%. And so, and TAM, just again, it, it just means that you can, your your model can, um, is going to be appealing to the, the, the entire market space, okay? Uh, that everybody's going to run to you. And what he's saying is like, yeah, sure, you know, uh, that you, you, if you're losing money, everybody's going to flock to you, right? So, so when people when people value these companies on revenues or potential revenues, you have to understand that the revenues are inherently unprofitable. Give away twenty dollar bills for ten dollars on the street corner, you will have an incredible growth rate. Um, and and so, this is trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, really. Right now, they're all going up, right? The, the legitimate businesses are going up with the absurd money losing, structurally money losing businesses. And so, you know, it's going to take some patience, I think, um, and structure in your portfolio to figure out what to be long and what to be short. But uh, there certainly is no shortage now of crazy TAM stories. <laughs> uh, one of my favorites is the sports betting market. I mean, people have just discovered sports betting. And, uh, you know, I, I'm guessing you and the boys have put a few wagers on games, you know, maybe once or twice in your life. Um, the sports betting uh, total revenues in the U.S. sports betting market last year was under a billion dollars. That's that's the win, not the handle. That's the amount that the companies kept, not the amount in bet. Um, it's probably going to be closer to two billion this year. And we have roughly 40 percent of all the states doing sports betting but the total u.s gambling market's 80 billion dollars it's been growing at about two percent a year forever basically growing with inflation um now the the tam for sports betting alone if you believe the bulls over the next five to ten years is supposed to go to 30 billion dollars well that 30 billion dollars is going to come out of probably the general gambling take um it's not going to be additive. And so I, I, I look at these things and say, okay, well, you, you basically are thinking there's going to be a 30 fold increase in the market um, to justify the valuations. And a lot of these companies will still be losing money five years into this growth rate. And, and sports betting uh, is, is interesting. If you ever go to a casino, and Keith, I don't know if you've ever been to a casino. <laughs> All right. So what he's saying here, and, and this is how you value something. Okay, now he's he's applying it to individual stocks, but but think about what he's saying. He's saying there's about eighty billion dollars. Okay, and sports betting is about one billion dollars. So the valuation of the company today is that they're going to capture thirty billion. Okay, fair enough. You're going to capture thirty billion of the eighty billion. So that means from the one billion that you are now, maybe two billion this year, that you're you're going to have to go out and capture another 28 billion but that 28 billion has to come out of somewhere from somebody else it's not adding another 30 billion on top of the 80 okay you follow so when you have a growth rate of only two percent which is inflation all right then why would you go out and buy these stocks and take away from the casinos.
who also have sports betting. You have to take it away from the casino. So the the entire market, the entire entire eighty billion is going to be diluted. You see, that's the supply. There's a dilution. I hope you're understanding me. If not, just post a question and I'll try to answer it. But uh, the smallest the smallest amount of real estate in any casino and the least least attractive amount of real estate in any casino is the sports book. It's the least profitable part of any casino. Yep. The uh, the win percent is about five to six percent versus thirteen percent nine percent overall for a casino and thirteen percent for slots. So again, this is not a great business. Sports betting is not a great business. Uh, I don't know of any bookies um, who've gotten fabulously wealthy, you know, booking sports bets. Um, it's so it's it's amazing. It's amazing to me. But we've now created a TAM story around uh, around people betting on football. Well, and, I, I uh, mean, depending on what your proclivities are and your, the risk you're willing to take to take on an orange jumpsuit for life, um, you know, there being a certain kind of a bookie can be uh, quite profitable to, 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 <laughs> to a certain person. But. Um, not as a public company. I mean, it's it's you know. I'm assuming that you're short DraftKings. Is that is is this the name? Well, that we're... I, 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 I'm not going to mention what we we are short uh, some of the casino companies. I will say say that because uh, they've got they've got additional problems, um, particularly the Las Vegas casinos. And I've been a big bear on on uh, the Vegas casinos for a while now. Yeah. Not, not because of COVID. Uh, COVID has certainly made it worse, but there just is more and more competition for what was uh, Las Vegas, which was a unique destination uh, for years and years and years. Atlantic City is is uh, was never really the competition for Las Vegas, and uh, and Las Vegas expanded well beyond gambling, you know, about 20 years ago with mm -hmm. the advent of the Bellagio and the Mirage, um, and uh, and and now it became a place to go have dinner, have great restaurants, nightclubs, pools, you know, that whole thing. Well, I'm talking to you from Miami. Miami has that right now without the gambling. Yeah. Um, millennials aren't big gamblers, and so the peak for strip casino gaming revenue was 2007. Mm -hmm. And so Vegas has had to basically compete on everything else, um, conventions, pools. But again, it's a no growth market and um, and people are putting increasing multiples on the casino stocks because they're hoping they're going to get online and do a lot of other things. But if you actually look at the fundamentals, the numbers, um, they're stunningly bad. And uh, I think sports betting is going to is going to grow pretty rapidly for the next couple of years as the states implement it. But once you get 30, 40 states um, implementing it, you'll you'll see the market slow down. And it's not as if we don't have online gambling. Uh, the UK and the EU have had it for years. Yeah. And uh, William Hill, yeah. William Hill just got basically just being bought out at a fraction of the price of where the U.S. guys trade at. It's not as if this this isn't uh, this isn't a known market. Um, if if we gamble as much as the uh, Brits do or the Aussies do, two of the most gambling mad you know societies out there. Uh, the total amount of win in U U.S. sports betting will be about four or five billion dollars, uh, and that's if we gamble as much as as the Brits and the Aussies. Well, I, I think and that's. So a, I think the thirty billion number. Yeah. The, the All right. So, do you see how he broke it down versus other people in CNBC and so forth? Do you see how he did the analysis? I think that is the most important aspect of this whole entire video that he looked at the entire market, he took the best of the best, he looked, took the growth rate, he said, okay, if sports betting is the least amount uh, a casino makes of, you know, 5% versus the 13% from slots, and it's 9% average, there's more competition coming on, it's not growing more than 2%, um, you're going to have um, companies, sports betting companies that are going to be, I guess, 40% of the, uh, or 40 states at a uh, in the United States, and then when you take those valuations and you go over to Europe, where it already existed, and someone just sold their uh, company for a fraction, a fraction of the valuation of uh, the companies in the U.S. today, you, you see how all-encompassing it is? That's macro, right? Now, that's a specific 
sector and industry that he's talking about but if that's the way you know you approach everything where you try to grasp the entire market and what it's actually doing and that that you understand that the meat and potatoes of everything you're going to be successful you're not going to be perfect you're not going to time it perfect it's not what it's about but you're going to understand what a multiple expansion is so like i told you before if sports betting were to grow then it has to take away from the other 80 billion so who is the other 80 billion where's well, the casinos right so you're not adding it's the same thing with with amazon walmart right they're not adding to consumption they're just destroying other small businesses and they are uh, uh, taking everything for themselves it's not like an apple or or um, or microsoft right where they're actually creating efficiencies for example in airplanes now we use ipads before we used to have to carry you know 40 pounds of books uh, the cloud, right? It creates that efficiency where you can have access to your information anywhere, anytime, any place. You know, th these are the things that you have to um, apply in the real world. So let me give you an example. And unfortunately, I have this uh, window kind of small, but this is advertising media uh, revenue worldwide. Okay. Uh, and this is 2012, 2024. So forget about the, the last four. We're going to look at uh, up, up to 2020, 19. Okay. So it was 586 uh, billion dollars is what was spent on advertising worldwide. How much of that went to Google? Well, Google made uh, 162 billion, right? Uh, one fifth of all revenue. Well, how about Facebook? You know, how about Snapchat? How about Baidu? How about, you know, all these other uh, companies who are fighting for the same piece of the pie, right? So you start there. Then you start going down and you see, you know, how much Facebook is getting, how much everybody else is getting, who's their closest competitor. But but I'm just trying to, to convey uh, a way for you to think about how to value something because that's that's what's important everybody's looking at the stock market going straight up and saying oh, okay well we're going back to normal market is a forward-looking indicator blah 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 right it, it, it's you know the market is rigged la 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 whatever they don't understand the savings bubble they don't understand the more deficits the more QE you know pushes down bond yields, which pushes up earnings yield, which pushes up stock prices, but those stock prices end up being, you know, in terms of the valuation, very uh, high. The the effect of ETFs just buying across the board, no matter what, not really looking at valuations, right? They, they don't understand all these things. They don't understand the law of diminishing returns. They don't understand that no government can print value for a currency. That's why the velocity of money is collapsing. That's why GDP to uh, public debt is collapsed. They don't understand these things. And probably you're not understanding what I'm saying right now either. <laughs> That's why you have to come down and subscribe to patreon.com slash real macro. But, but what Jim is saying is so right, it's so good but people just don't understand him. Anyway, let's continue. The TAM, I mean, when you reverse engineer the TAM, that's the best way to start with these shorts, at least like, you know, our analysts would certainly agree with that. Uh, MGM's a stock that we're short, so that I think kind of fits the profile of having a, a significant exposure to the strip. Or you're just, yeah, there are a lot of businesses like that, Jim, where, you know, Baby Boomer's product is not, to your point, what millennials you know, would consider something that they want to go smoke some darts and, you know, you know, you know twist the handles on, on slot machines. That's just not what they're doing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, 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 of evidence, like at least we would say. I guess, um, you know, back to, you're not going to give me the ticker on that. Uh, I put in flip for the house flipping uh, SPAC, but I couldn't. N uh, ironically, nobody has the ticker flip. Um, you know, that's not a ticker. That's, that's not somebody that something's pick, somebody's picked. But I, think, I think it still has the, I still think it has the, uh, the ticker of, of the, uh, the, the holding company they haven't changed yet uh it's ipob ipob um but uh yeah yeah okay but uh and and the company is open anyway this stuff is not something that interests us i'm going to stop it there all right let's continue i fast forward a little sounds bit. cool <laughs> you can I, look it up <laughs> i did um all right well 
Yeah, on, on something um, you know, that sounds like, the, the way that you explain, uh, I'm gonna sell you something for X and just lose money on it perpetually, but tell you the TAM is large. I mean, I think we all know, you know what company has done that with the most market cap currently today, um, which is Tesla. So I mean, you know, that thing, um, like I have, I, I actually just shorted it today because um, I'm like, you know, this thing, this actually fits my profile, which is what I said, Jim, which is it, it finally stops going up. That's identifiably, my four kids could tell you when the bubble pops, you know, in the yard, they got to blow another one. And um, it makes a lower high, and now it's sitting there, and it's the short interest has actually fallen. Uh, it's, and, no, and a lot of people are scared to short that stock. I mean, most people are scared to short that stock. Uh, <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> All right, let me stop here for a second because I'm going to have to show you what he means by that lower high. All right, so here's Tesla. This is what he's saying. He shorted it. He just shorted it because he had the lower high, broke the uptrend, correcting through time, and this was looking. To, I even had it down as, a, as this was going to fall apart as well. It had a nice little head and shoulders right in there. Okay. You have that lower high right in here it's ready to go and what happens well they come out and they say well we're going to add this to the S&P <laughs> right so what happens then boom off to the moon it goes right that's why you can't you don't know you cannot know it's not possible for you to know what kind of fuckery is going to come around the corner right you just have to battle it out you have to manage the trade you have to wait but since then all right let's let's just even take the the neckline, forget about the bottom. The stock is up literally 47%, okay, 47%. This was ready to go, it was done. And then just because it was added to the S&P 500, well, guess what? Well, now every fund has to own it, so everybody runs out and they have to buy it, right? So it can be part of that ETF, because remember, ETFs, they don't give a shit about valuation. They just say, look, this is a part of the of the S&P now, then I have to go buy. Like it or not, I have to go buy. It's the same thing with the with the savings bubble. bubble. If you're going to deficit spend, if you're going to QE, and you're going to flood the, mar the, the market with money, well, guess what? I have to go buy. I'm a fund manager. You are giving me money. I am paid to go out and buy things. So I go out and I buy things. And then everybody does it at the same time. And then what happens to the market? It goes straight up. So the more you print, the more you have to print. The more you QE, the more you have to QE. The more you helicopter money, the more you have to helicopter money. And that's where we've gotten. That's where we've gotten from 2006 to 2020, right? You just have to continuously just keep pumping money for the market to go up. But there's a law of diminishing returns. That's fundamental to everything, right? So eventually, eventually the law of diminishing return is going to kick in. It always does. It's not, I, I don't know how to explain it to people sometimes. Um, but they, 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 you know, they're momos, so they come out and they're like, oh, look, the market is going up. You know, the vaccine, the vaccine is going to fix, the vaccine is not going to fix the structural economic problems. You can pump the market up all you want. You, it's not going to fix it. You can vaccinate all you want. You still have structural problems. What are those structural problems? The structural problems are that you have to go back to consuming the same as you did back in January at these prices. Okay, this is not the NASDAQ, but uh, you, you, can't, you can't be at all-time highs and consumption uh, lagging. You can't have a bunch of zombie companies running around and everybody's telling you, well, they're AAA. Everything is AAA. Everything is AAA. It doesn't matter what it is. Stock market AAA. Hertz, bankrupt AAA. Everything is AAA. You can't have that. Because companies that are zombies, what is a zombie company? A zombie company is a company that has more liabilities than assets. So what's going to happen if you just keep them afloat? If you just give them enough cash to make next payment on uh, the debt, right? Next month's payment on the debt, all right? And you're going to keep them around, fine, that's great. But guess what? Even if you keep them afloat, they're not going to maximize profit. They're going to seek to reduce debt. Debt reduction is deflationary. That's not going to create more jobs. That's not going to create more jobs. And if you listen to Ku, Ku will explain it to you. He says it very simple, that 
you cannot have economic growth if companies are seeking to reduce debt liabilities and not maximize profit it's not going to grow <laughs> how are you going to create jobs if you're looking to cut costs right and maximize and i'm sorry and, and and reduce debt there's no economic book that is running around teaching people that hey you know insolvent companies can can survive they can survive and everything is going to be great and you know this is how we do it and then uh, the economy grows what show me show me a textbook that says that nowhere right so what are we doing what are we doing nobody knows what we're doing we're just printing for the fucking sake of doing it calling it many different tools as the the central bank would say well we have tools you have one tool you print that's it <laughs> and then you qe to, to to liquefy those bonds into into cash and suppress uh, interest rates right push stocks into riskier assets push blow out uh uh, asset price inflation and then all the little no nothings all the little momos that come out you know little taxi drivers and, and i'm not saying that the, i'm saying they know nothing about stocks and finance and so forth they're telling you oh yeah go out and buy stocks yeah look the market is going up ha 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 look how smart i am bubble boy bubble boy right and they don't have a fucking clue as to what they're talking about you know they're going to show you silly little news clippings from the from the newspaper look let me take a picture of this look you know if you would have held your money into the account you are up now you know if you included dividends and if you kept buying and if you man what are you talking about what world do you live in you don't even have a clue what value is like buffett says price is what you pay value is what you get you think you're getting value here delusional absolutely delusional here's i'm just going to shut up after this and we'll go back to the video when you think you know everything you're fucked when you only have answers and no questions you're fucked right how many guys was oh, by the dip <laughs> by the tip <laughs> oh yeah i'm gonna nibble on the way down okay you want to nibble on the way down you gotta sell first because if you're fully invested you can't buy you're stuck in that okay and if for 10 years more than 10 years all you've done was buy the dip buy the dip buy the dip buy the dip and you've been rewarded every single time what makes you think that you're going to know when you should take your money out so you can go out and buy the dip and nibble on the way down huh how are you going to know you're not you're going to be stuck in it you will only run around in little social media circles and be like yes buy the dip see ha, 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 the whole entire time and calling people bubble boy and all this bullshit but in reality your underwear is going to be bleeding because you're not going to see it coming you're not going to see it coming you're all going to be just a big mouthpiece talking around harding everything thumbs up everything is great so when you think the dollar is going to be king forever which and you know it you know the stock market is always going to go up and you know it right it's a given everything is a given when you know that uh, a vaccine is going to uh, be uh, taken by everybody and it's going to go away we're going to go back to normal and the economy is going to just magically rebound when you know that the deficit doesn't matter that hey we can just print to infinity right everything is a given when, when you know everything that's when you're fucked I'm telling you now, that's when you're fucked. When there's skepticism, like there was in 2008, right? There's a lot of hope that things are going to go right. But when everybody knows that everything is a given, well, America is the greatest country and we're the best and we're the greatest and da 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 da, right? When you know that, <laughs> you are in for a big, big surprise, my friends. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and I'm not, I'm not going to waver. I'm a meathead, right? I'm autistic when it comes to that shit. And all I'm going to say until the day comes when it starts to correct, even a correction, I don't give a shit what it is. The day, until that day comes, bid price up on yourselves. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's all yours. Keep buying. Keep pushing up price on your, on, on your, on your own selves. And then one day you're all going to puke it up and you're going to be holding it all the way the fuck down. And you're going to sell at the bottom gonna sell at the bottom you're gonna puke it up I'm telling you you will you will remember my words 
because the only analysis that you guys are doing, I'm talking about the promo bulls, the only analysis they're doing is everything is a given. They're only going to accept what CNBC and what, what incubator economists are going to offer them. And they're going to be like, yes, and they're going to pick the bullish side and everything. It doesn't matter. Everything is good. Everything is always going to be good. And, and markets will always go up. And you're going to see it. And then when I'm buying, and it'll probably go down even further and keep going down, I'll be saying, no, buy, 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 buy. Every single one of you are going to call me, oh, you know, you bull boy. You're such a bull. You're such a perma bull. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That's when it's going to be the bottom. Remember me. I'm telling you right here today. Okay, rant over. <laughs> I'll shut the fuck up. All right, let, let's play a little more. Well, at but least the recommendation I gave you last year worked out so well. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, look, this one, this is the poster child. I, you know, we're still short. Uh, this is the poster child for this bull market. I, I don't care what anyone says. This is this is the stock upon which investors, TAM investors, retail investors, algorithmic investors, everybody is put, putting their hopes and dreams on this one company. And and you know it's not just it's not just uh, EVs. It's the whole ESG mania, which he fits in perfectly. I'm I'm the green company leader. Um, and 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 when you tell somebody it's a car ah you see i'm the green leader right exactly uh, many guys have asked me why is tesla going up but because it's in the right industry promoting what is you know uh socially acceptable okay that it's green that it's green and everybody loves it and it's going to be you're going to hear him say it uh, I think that, you know, there's so many people for so many different reasons that want to buy Tesla and they keep bidding up the price, bidding up the price, bidding up the price. Eventually, they're all going to get screwed royally, royally. Reality will hit. He knows it. He knows it. If you know something, you wait, you wait, you be patient, you manage it, you know, get those seven uh, trades wrong, but get that one right. It's all you need. One right. Anyway, let's, let's, I'll shut up. But again, it's a green company, so we should go buy it. Ooh, fist up in the air. Goobers. Car company, they'll tell you it's a tech company, um, <laughs> but then they'll point to their sales of cars in China. And, and so it, it's, it's like this, this piece of mercury that just constantly moves around every time you try to just say, well, you know, look, it doesn't make money um, selling $50,000 cars. Uh, and never has, um, then it, people will transition to, oh, well, it's an energy company. <laughs> now I love the latest one, it's a battery company. Yeah, battery company. Uh, well, when you point out a battery that battery companies, trade, yeah, battery companies trade at you know, eight times earnings in Japan and Korea, um, <laughs> you know, well, then now you don't get it because they've reinvented the battery. Uh -huh. And I joked when they had Battery Day a few weeks ago that there were no batteries at Battery Day. <laughs> they literally didn't show anything. And that was so, like when they. Uh, this, so this. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a narrative. This is not. A, this is a narrative. It's a four hundred and fifty billion dollar narrative. It's. It's really. You can't justify it any way, shape, or form, uh, in terms of the fundamentals at this point. So it's hopes and dreams. Um, I, I pointed out, I think, on Twitter about a month ago, there was an analyst who raised his price target, uh, some ridiculous amount of money, a percent. And uh, he hiked his revenue figure um, some just dramatically going out five years. And then when you looked at his discounted cash flow analysis, uh, he hadn't increased his CapEx spending um, for all the factories that were needed to get to that revenue number. And, and you know, it, this is what's passing for analysis these days. And nobody cared that they just, just I'm going to change numbers because the stock price is higher, but I can't really tell you how I get there. Uh, because you can't get there. Yeah, you don't need and, to get and there. So, can you imagine? Can you imagine? And you're living it. You're here today. You're living through this. Just like people lived through 2000. I'm telling you, it's it's coming. <laughs> it's comical. When you understand it, it's fucking comical. And you're like, all right, fuck it. Keep buying. Keep bidding up price on yourself, please. Please keep doing it, please, because I will fuck you. Your underwear is going to be bloody when I get done with you. Just wait.
It's just like you did. Yeah, and you don't, and you haven't needed to get. Yeah, what's interesting about that one? I mean, it's most exactly. recently found its way. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with it, but the Goldman Hedge Fund Hotel, you know, long book, which is basically uh, the ETF, the GVIP. So I'm like looking yeah. at this thing. I'm thinking, okay, you know, I, I think the bubble's starting to pop. You know, I do have a view on that. And, you know, because I'm still young enough to screw it up another time. But I mean, it's 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 you know, or maybe not. You know, so I'm looking at this hedge fund hotel book, and Tesla is the number one long, okay? So it's the number one holding in the GVIP, the ETF, is Tesla. So it's not just, um, and there, there are a lot of different ways that you could say that that, that, that that came to be. You could say, well, hedge funds you know, are kind of in the ha-ha trade. You know, it's got price momentum. It's got the attributes that the, that the machine itself likes, uh, and they don't really care for the analysis. They're just playing the momentum. Um, or, or a series of other reasons that that, that that could be. But it's different than the sell side being negligent on the numbers. I mean, that, that's the buy side, right? That's, I'm going to put my LPs in this because of price momentum, and we're just going to run over Jim Chanos and the rest of the people that are, you know, like, ha-ha. <laughs> well, I would, I would be, be curious. I think, I, I think, I could be wrong. Someone could check this. I think it might have been in the Goldman Sachs short basket a year ago. Uh, most heavily shorted stocks a year ago, or, or yeah. hedge fund short basket. A year ago, uh, yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. I, 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 I'd have, uh, don't need to fact check that to believe that. Um, but now, but, but now it's in every price momentum basket on the long side, and the only thing you need to eradicate price momentum, as you know, is high and rising volatility. So I can't, for the life of me, say like, why wouldn't I short one of the biggest, you know, basically story stocks in the history of humanity? Uh, this would be like, like tulips had as good of a story as this, I'm sure. But you know, there was no machine perpetuating the upside; it still went there. You you end up with a place as long as Nasdaq volatility has got a three in front of it. Why wouldn't you short Tesla? I mean, the catalyst to me is that it's going down. Let's start there. Do you think that that that, that that's a fair point, like uh, as a catalyst? Because people are going to say, Jim, what's your catalyst? Yeah, I mean, again, it, 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 every market is different, but this market analog to me most resembles you know, early 2000. And they, they just, they started going down and, and, and although the S&P I think made a higher high uh, in, in summer or fall of 2000, NASDAQ didn't and the story stocks really didn't. Um, and every, every leg down uh, on the S&P, they went down sort of 2X to 3X. Um, people forget the, the, the S&P was down 40% from peak to trough in 2002, and NASDAQ was down 80%. So it was every bit as bad, if not worse, than the uh, GFC in 08, 09. And uh, I think that that we'll have to see. I mean, we have much more leverage right now, given the call volume trading that's happening at retail. Yeah. And uh, and so I, you know, this thing could 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 any of these story stocks could. Uh, could drop uh, uh, very quickly um, on a change of sentiment, and um, we'll just have to see. We'll just have to see uh, how that plays out. But I do think I do think it's it's hard to ignore that Tesla is the the, the one stock that that people are putting hopes and dreams on, and sort of disregarding the the the, the sort of ugly fundamentals of the car business. Yeah, four hundred and fifty billion. Actually, today it's four. When I shorted it, I had to make sure that it's still at a four in front of it. Four hundred and nineteen billion. Um, and I'll remember that. We'll see. You know, let's let's see. Um, and one one big pushback people have, and this is a great tweet that you had the other day. I think you're tweeting it at a guy named Joe. I think I know who he is. Um, on October the seventh, a lot of people will say, "Well, you you know, it's the Fed. You got to buy Tesla." Um, okay, uh, whatever. But someone you, you you tweeted, "Someone please tell Joe that the Fed bailed out markets and banks in 2020, 2008, 1998 LTCM, 1990s SNLs, and 1982 the Third World." Um, <laughs> I think you're the only short seller alive that was short selling like successfully in all those periods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I started in '82. Uh, I started. Right. I, I was a, I was an investment banker for two years, and then I, I I decided to get on the straight and narrow and go into short selling at the market bottom in '82. So <laughs> that gives you a sense of my market time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember all those, and I, I remember you know. That we've been having we've been having bailouts now for uh, every every sort of uh, you know eight to ten years. Yeah, that's not the buy signal. That is the beginning of the end signal. Uh, and I've been fortunate. I've only um, I've only only 
uh, been able to trade through three of those, this being the third. Um, IBM, this actually surprised me. You see? You see? This being the third. He's honest with himself. You know, he has, he doesn't, he admits, I don't have that experience you have. That, to me, is, is someone that I, I want to listen to. He's honest. You, and on the other hand, and we'll, we'll end the video here, it's an hour. Jim Chanos is that old captain uh, that's seen just about fucking everything there is to see. And you see the way he presents himself, how he does the analysis, right? Very easily. He doesn't even think twice about it. All encompassing, macro, right? And then it works his way down. He doesn't have to know when it's going to happen. He doesn't uh, pretend to know when it's going to happen. He manages the trade. He'll tell you how it is. Let it be. Let them bid a price. I don't care. Okay? And then when the time comes, I'm going to make money. And he knows that. And he's so cool and calm and, like, yeah, whatever. You know? And that's that's the, you know, I hope one day I could be as cool, as calm, and chilled as he is. Um, that's a real pro. And that's, that's how you should... Um, try to strive for not this bullshit oh, look the market is going up oh, bye 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 <laughs> I'm right <laughs> right those you're clowns the people that are like that you're clowns all right uh, you're wasting your time you're gonna lose your money eventually uh, buy the dippers nibblers and all these you know uh, momo guys you guys don't have a clue you won't you won't last in this game you won't last. there's a reason why Jim lasted 35 40 years whatever it is All right so that's it for this video uh it's a little bit different than i usually do um i hope you learned something from it uh, i hope you you know at least i tickle your curiosity uh, at least i give you a different perspective something to think about and and that will make me uh happy again don't forget to like and subscribe come down to patreon.com slash real macro if you want to learn more and um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Have a good weekend and talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.